Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, let's give Jesus one more big hand clap of praise this morning. God is so good. And let's welcome everybody that's watching at Church Online as well. We're so excited to have you watching with us wherever you are. Uh, If it's in the triangle, hey, we're here every Sunday. And we have worship services at 915 and 11 o'clock a.m. And would welcome you to come and join us in person. There's nothing like it being with God's people, in God's presence together. And just excited to have you today here with us as we continue our series in the Gospel of Mark. So if you've got your Bibles, our text today is going to be in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And we're going to be working through verses 35 through 41. It's a very familiar story if you were raised in church. And if you weren't raised in church, y'all going to have fun today. Okay, this is going to be a good time. Before we do that, I'm going to read a scripture from Isaiah chapter 40 to start us off. Okay, this is the word of the Lord. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Let me translate that for you. It's the writer of Isaiah saying, what is happening, God, where I cry out to you time and time again because of these awful circumstances, and you don't hear me? Verse 28, it says, have you not known Have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not grow faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary And young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of God. Now, like I said before we get into our text today, this is a very familiar story. This is one of these amazing miracles that we see of Jesus. And remember, as we're walking through the Gospel of Mark here, you see these very defining ways that this particular Gospel was written. Uh, you really, in, in the context, when you compare them to the other Gospels, Matthew and Luke and John, and you see these very, very action packed segments of Scripture. This word keeps coming up time and time again as we read, and you'll see it today this word immediately, immediately, immediately. And they went immediately, and this is what Jesus did. And it gives us this very clear cut picture of who Jesus is because we see his actions time and time again. And we believe this is Peter's account of the Gospels that he shared with John Mark, the writer of this gospel. And as we go along, I'm going to point out some things that kind of dispel some of the opinions that the world has about the gospel accounts. You'll hear people say all the time, well, the gospels were written 100 years after all the eyewitnesses died. Time out, chief. Where's your proof on that? In fact, all of the actual empirical and factual data and evidence is pointing to the fact that these were written by the actual writers during the lifetime of these eyewitnesses. And, and, and if you're in academia and you're not a believer and you're watching this message, just know this, I do recognize there is a strong segment of, uh, you know, of academia that believes that the, the gospel accounts were written during the lifetime of those eyewitnesses, but still many say they weren't. Well, I wanna show you why that's simply untrue. And I'm gonna take some time as we go through the scripture here today to point some of these things out. And I wanna hopefully bring some more colors, more insight, and and see some more truth in this story, maybe beyond what we've been taught since we were kids. Let's go into the word of God. Mark chapter four, verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he, that's Jesus, said to them, let us go across to the other side. Now, church family, don't forget that. Don't forget that in our text today. Verse 36. And leaving the crowd, they took him, that's Jesus, with them in the boat, just as he was. What does that mean? 
just as he was. We'll talk about that in a moment. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear. And they said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of God. Now, this very familiar story that most of us that were raised in or around church know is one where we've been probably taught something through the years that the main context of the scripture, the main meaning behind it is something like this, like it kind of rhymes, right? It's if Jesus calms the sea, then he can calm the storm inside of me. If you've heard that before, give me a little nod. Anybody? Yeah, a bunch of us. And you know what? That's not wrong, okay? Let me go ahead and establish this. This isn't going to be one of those messages where it's like, ha preacher, you were wrong. No, no, that's correct. That's right. If Jesus calms the seas, he can calm the storm inside of me. There's things that are brewing and going on in your life. You've got to remember who the true master is who has power over all of those things. And this story clearly shows us that's who Jesus is. But if that's all there is, we can just go ahead and take up an offering, sing another song, and say amen and go home. And those of us that don't cheer for Carolina can lick our wounds and just pray that the Lord brings healing to our hearts. That's all I have to say about that. Continuing in the word. So here's the thing with this particular passage. I think that there's more to it to draw out, okay? I think, wow, that's very, very true, and that's a great takeaway. Tell that one to your kids. Help them to remember that story based on that memory hook because it's true. If Jesus calms the seas, he can calm the storm inside of me, yes. But there's more. There's more to this, and I want us to lean into this truth. And to do that, we've got to look at the details, all right? Because details matter. And as we look at these eyewitness accounts, the details of the story are what prove that they are exactly that. Okay? Now, like, for instance, <clears throat> think about something, a happy memory that you have with friends or family, something funny, something hilarious that happened. I don't know. You just, whatever that is. And if you're telling the story, you're probably going to share some pretty colorful details if you were there, weren't you? Wouldn't you? Like, for instance, there was a Christmas in the Mariner household, where one of the Mariner boys, I'm not going to say which one, they were very young, grace abides. My mom's not in this service, so I don't have her eyes looking at me like daggers because she still feels the pain of what happened. But a Christmas tree might have gotten tackled and taken down to the ground and scattering all the ornaments all over the living room, maybe. And I might have been the Mariner boy that tackled the tree. Uh, it's possible. And there also could be an instance of us trying to play catch with some of the Christmas balls before that tree got tackled, uh, you know, and that's quite possible. And one of them was red and got broken all over the red carpet, and I might have stepped on one and cut myself and tried to hide that so that my mom didn't spank me for cutting myself with a Christmas ornament. That's how frightened I was at the time. Okay, so now the whole point of what I just shared with you was that I tackled the Christmas tree. I didn't have to tell you about catch with the Christmas ornament. Didn't have to tell you about breaking one on the red carpet. Didn't have to tell you the carpet was red. But because I was there, I shared all those details, right? Well, let's look at this account based on hearing this from someone that was there in the boat. All right, let's look at these details. Number one, he's on a boat and other boats were with him. He's on a boat. Other boats were with him. And do we need to know that there's other boats there? No. But the person that saw it remembered there were these other boats. So in the beginning of chapter 4, 
Jesus began to teach by the lake. He's there by the Sea of Galilee, and the crowd's pressing in on him so much that instead of them just getting right up in his personal space where he can't really teach, so he's not like spitting all over people, what he does is he gets into a boat, a fishing boat, and they push him about, you know, five, ten feet into the water, and he then is teaching from the boat to the people that are standing on the seashore. So he's got a little amphitheater going, and he's got a little floating pulpit, Okay, so Jesus was in a boat. There were other boats with him there. And so as he's teaching, the Bible says this in Mark 4, 36. Fast forward to our text. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. So what what does that mean? Like they took him with him in a boat. Like we get that. But just as he was, what does that mean? Well, what they're saying was he was already in a boat teaching. So he got out of one boat And then he stepped in to another boat to go across the sea. So they took him into another boat just as he was. He was already in a boat. If you're tracking so far, say, "Uh uh-huh. Now, you're going to notice some things. You're going to notice that the details are such that this is clearly an eyewitness account. So this is Peter telling the story. Let's look at some of these details. It was evening. There was a great windstorm. The waves, they were breaking into the boat. Remember, this was a windstorm. It doesn't say there was a bunch of rain falling, does it? We see it in our mind like there's a bunch of rain falling. It says that there was a windstorm, and it was causing the waves to crash into the boat. Jesus was in the boat. Jesus was sleeping in the boat. Jesus was sleeping in the stern of the boat. All right, for you land lovers out there, for those of you that don't really understand what that means. All right, let me... Let me help you out a little bit, okay? The stern simply means that you were in the back of the boat, right? So Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat on a cushion in the stern in the back of the boat. The disciples woke him up. Jesus rebuked the wind. Jesus spoke to the sea. He said, peace, be still. Jesus asked the disciples after that, why are you so afraid? The disciples, they were filled with what? Fear, not just fear, but great fear. And the disciples say, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Friends, it's because details matter. And you will remember this sermon because it was the day when your pastor put a captain's hat on his head and started talking to everybody in the crowd. You may forget what the sermon's all about, but you'll remember. Do you remember that day that Nate put that captain's hat on his head? Why are you going to remember that? Because you were here. You were an eyewitness to what just happened today. And details matter. And you remember the details if you were present to see them. And you were present to hear them. And the disciples gave such great detail, like Peter's account here, because he was there. This wasn't some idea that popped up in somebody's mind a hundred years after the disciples had died. In fact, there was a Cambridge scholar who said this, like to hear the telling of Jesus calming the sea. At first, it would sound like a legend, but I've never, ever thought it to be so because of the great details of the story. So, look, so you got a couple of options out here. If you're here today and you, you don't believe in God, you don't believe the Bible's true or anything like that, I am so, so glad that you're here because I can at least land this one point with you. All right, for those of you that think that the Gospels you know, were written 100 years after the disciples died and that they were legends, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. The Gospels were written too early to be legends because they were written at the time of the eyewitnesses still being alive. And they were too detailed to be legends. All right, and then for those of us that, that think that this was somehow written this way 100, 100 years after the disciples died, um, here's what you believe. If you, if you truly believe that, then this is what you believe because this is the context of how the gospel was written. It was written in what we call modern narrative realistic fiction. We love to read books today that are written in modern narrative realistic fiction. Y'all Tom Clancy much? Yeah, I mean, think about it. When people take events from actual history and they incorporate it into a fictitious story, it's exciting. You, you watch television shows that intrigue you like, um, like, like, like Homeland. Or you watch you know, shows about some, some secret agent character that, that's working for the government that you know, he got recruited right before 9-11. And it's, just a, it's a made-up story, but they take real events from history and they weave it in. That's modern, realistic narrative fiction. 
Like, this form of writing has only been around since the 1850s. It got started in, in, in Russian literature and French literature in the 1850s. So if you think that this gospel account just boop, popped up 100 years after the eyewitnesses died in this format, then you believe that the gospel of Mark was written without any successors or predecessors. Then he suddenly discovered modern narrative realistic fiction and then just stopped. Like he wrote this gospel and then no more for 1,800 years until boop, all of a sudden this literature pops up in France and in Russia. It's what you believe. If you think that this was not written in the time of the disciples by the eyewitnesses. All right, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Let's keep going. Here's a question. Why were the disciples on the sea? As we break down the text today, answer this question in your heart, your mind. Why were the disciples on the sea? And why did they end up in the storm? This is going to help some people today right here. I want us to pay attention to this. Okay, we're shifting away from an apologetic proving that this was a text written and seen by the eyewitnesses. And I'm shifting into what this means directly for your heart. Remember, if Jesus calms the sea, he calms the storm inside of me. That's true, but there's more that we need to extract from the text today. There's more truth here to look at. Why were the disciples on the sea? How about this? To answer that question, let's look at why they were not there. Here's why they were not there. They weren't on the boat because of disobedience. Can I say that again? They were not on the boat. They were not in the storm because of disobedience. They weren't there because of stupid decisions that got there. Jesus said, get in the boat. We're going to the other side. And all of a sudden, they found themselves in the storm of their life. So here's the truth that we have got to wrestle with today. That sometimes obedience to Jesus will bring you into the eye of the storm. The obedience that the disciples had for Christ brought them into this storm. And this is a truth from the word of God that we are being confronted with today. So often do we look at the difficult times in our life and we say, why God, why, why are you doing this to me? When what our prayer needs to be is, Lord, I know that you're with me in this most difficult time of my life. What are you teaching me? What is your purpose for my life as I'm going through this? Also, I know that you're going with me. And if you've made a promise and sealed it on my life with your precious Holy Spirit, that no matter what happens in this world, that one day I'm going to the other side with you. And I will step into eternity. And no matter what this world throws at me or how difficult life can be, the promise that you've made that I am forgiven of my sin, I've been made righteous by you, and one day I'll step into eternity with you can't be broken by anything this world throws at me. But in the meantime, Lord, it's hard. What are you teaching me? See, if we can shift our attitude to that, it's going to bring help. It's going to bring healing into our hearts and lives. But the disciples, they were caught up in their circumstances. You see, the disciples were thrown into the place that tested them and challenged them. But sometimes God, for his own purposes, will lead us into storms, into difficulty, into experiences that make us wonder sometimes whether we have any faith at all. And God is testing us and stealing our resolve. Friends, let me ask you, was it the easy times that caused you to grow the most in your life? It's a valid question, right? Or was it the most difficult times in your life where you had God and that was it, but he was enough and he saw you through that caused you to grow the most? Sometimes he'll lead us into and praise God. He will always lead us through the storms of life. Let's talk about the storm itself. Details matter, right? There was a great wind storm. Now, this is interesting to me, you know, because it's a weather thing. Um, and these windstorms happen very, very often out there in the region of Galilee. Now, let me tell you a little bit about kind of how this happened. So the Sea of Galilee, it sits at 650 feet below sea level. So 650 feet below where the Mediterranean Sea sits is where the Sea of Galilee sits. So you talk about a very, very warm place, but it's surrounded by mountains. Let me show you a picture. See this? This is kind of a picture all the way around Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee, where you have these mountains that crop up around the sea. Let's show you the next picture. You can kind of see this, you get this image here of these tall mountains, 
In fact, Mount Hermon, I don't know if you know anything about this, Mount Hermon stands like 9,200 plus feet in the air, and it's in the backdrop of the Sea of Galilee. It's often covered in snow. So you're down in this like tropical, not even subtropical, but tropical weather area at the shore of the Seas of Galilee, and then you're looking up at a snow-covered mountain. So this dichotomy, what it does sometimes when the wind shifts and blows over the mountains and down into the sea, off these really tall mountains like Mount Hermon, You have this very, very cold air that pushes down into an extremely warm air mass over the sea. And what happens? These violent windstorms erupt. And it's said that on this lake, the seas can get as high as 12, 13, sometimes 14 feet. Again, friends, we're talking about a lake that's 13 miles long and about six and a half miles wide. So it's a little bit smaller than Jordan Lake. Can you imagine being out on your bass boat with a line in the water and then out of nowhere, all of a sudden 14 foot swells come at you? You'd be swimming with those bass you were trying to fish for. You would. And so this storm comes out of nowhere and it's blowing like white squall kind of waves. And Jesus is asleep, and the disciples, they've got to wake him up. And they had passed the point, these disciples, they had passed the point where their know-how was was sufficient to be able to control the boat. They felt like everything they knew was now just kind of tossed out the door, and they were hanging on for their dear lives, doing all they could do, and they realized that what they could do was simply not enough. They had lost control or even realized that they were never in control in the first place. And so they're terrified. And they go to Jesus who's asleep on the cushion in the stern. And we know that because of all the details that have been given to us in this story. And they wake him up. Now, two things could have happened here. I'll tell you the first way I was taught. And then I'm going to tell you what I actually see in the word here today. What I was taught was that they went to Jesus because that was their only hope. Jesus is the one that can fix it. And we read the text today. We read the whole passage. All right, so there's this picture that you have where some would say that they came to Jesus. Jesus, please, quick, do something. Look at us, we're dying. But I don't see that in the word of God. I don't see that in our text today. Because to me, that sounds like you're putting the cart before the horse, right? Because they didn't get to the end of the story where Jesus calmed the sea and they said, high five, Jesus, we knew you could do it. Yeah, woo, fish on me, let's go eat. That's not what happened. What does the text say to us? It says that they looked at him and they were terrified. They realized that the thing they thought outside of that boat that was going to kill them paled in comparison to the power of the God that stood with them in the boat. And they saw the awesome power and authority of Jesus then for the first time. And they weren't filled with glee or cheer. It says that they were terrified because they thought that the bad thing was outside the boat. And then they realized the most awesome thing that the world could ever know was standing there with them. You see the difference? So here's what I believe. They went to Jesus to wake him up because they were like, well, if we're going to die, let's get all hands on deck out here. By the way, what was the main job of the disciples? What was the, what was the biggest career that they all were kind of bunched into? They were fishermen. So don't you think that they probably knew what to do in a storm on the boat? Don't you think that they had what they thought was the expertise to be able to navigate on the water when the rain and the wind came up? Because it happened all the time out there in Galilee. It wasn't anything new to them that they hadn't seen before. And so these fishermen that knew what they were doing, all of a sudden they said, you know what, let's wake him up. We're all going to die together, so we might as well get him up too. All hands on deck. Maybe we'll make it. Probably won't, but get him up. And so they went and they woke up Jesus for an all hands on deck moment. And notice what they asked him too. They said, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Imagine Jesus. Now this is the moment where I don't know. I'm, this is conjecture from Nate right now in this part, okay? Can you imagine what Jesus felt, though, when that question came to them? And when the, that question from his disciples came to him? Don't you care that we're dying? <laughs> I imagine Jesus, when he heard that, probably thought, you don't know I care because I invited you to be a part of my life? You don't know that I care because I'm in the boat with you right now? You don't know that I care because my words to you were 
We're going to go to the other side. Anyway, so Jesus hears this. He said, don't you care? We're all going to die. Jesus is thinking, man, because I'm in the world right now, because I care. That's just Nate's guess at how he might have reacted there. But that's why we started from Isaiah 40. Why did we start there? Why did we read that passage that said, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Let me read that to you in the Christian Standard Bible translation. It says, Jacob, why do you say, and Israel, why do you assert, my way is hidden from the Lord and my claim is ignored by my God? I read that because we have all been there, haven't we? Where life gets so difficult and we feel the weight of everything to the point where we just say, God, where are you? I'm here suffering and I need you. Where are you? We all come to that place, bad circumstances hit, and the waves start breaking over our boat, and we feel ourselves in danger of going down to the bottom of the lake. And then when those moments happen and life gets hard, we don't find ourselves quoting Jeremiah 29, 11, do we? For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prophesy for you, to give you a hope and a future and all that coffee cup, coffee mug stuff. And I love those verses of scripture, but I don't think that that's where we go when we get the call that the one that we love died suddenly. I don't think that that's where we go when we find that news that one of our children made one of the worst decisions they could ever make. I don't think that that's where we go when all of a sudden we get a pink slip from our boss and says, hey, thanks for the 25 years of service, you're fired. I don't think that's where we immediately move to. A lot of us in our natural state will look at the circumstances and say, God, where are you? When life gets difficult, We find ourselves like the disciples asking, Jesus, don't you care if we drown? See, the storm for the disciples, their immediate circumstances, was this undeniable challenge. And it came between them and their assurance of Jesus' care. It caused them to forget Jesus' word. And remember, I said this is a very important passage to remember today in our text. And I'll show it to you here. Mark 4, 35. And he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. He didn't say, let's go out on the lake, guys, and see if we can drown. He said, let's go to the other side. And isn't that what happens to us, that we doubt God cares? We forget his promises in his word. And when things get difficult, we don't cling to his word. In fact, we stop, for whatever reason, we're tempted to stop reading our Bibles. The one thing that keeps us focused on his promises and his truth, and we get so bogged down in how hard life is for us, that we detach ourselves from the things that will help to anchor us to Jesus. And we forget his promises. Look, when the whole thing's hitting the fan, we just say, what am I going to do now? Instead of turning to his truth. Jesus, don't you care if we drown? Let's keep on going in our text. I think we can all relate to that at some point, can't we? The word says in Mark 4, 39, and he awoke and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And this happened immediately. One of the favorite words that pop up in the Gospel of Mark. And that was such an astounding thing for the disciples. It wasn't, okay, we see Jesus saying something. Wait a minute, all right, I think something's happening. And over the next 15 to 25 minutes, things kind of calmed down and everybody was okay. That's not what happened. It says that Jesus rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still, and it was. Placid, glassy water in a moment. And the disciples all around them Witnessing what Jesus had done together in the boat were terrified. You see, this was a picture for them, and their Jewish minds went back to a very familiar story in Genesis, in the first chapter, where God said, let there be light. And there was. And they saw something in this Jesus standing in the boat with them that looked exactly like God, because Jesus is God. And so then, having calmed everything down, Jesus had a question for the disciples. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Why do you still have no faith? You see, 
The disciples' circumstances revealed their lack of trust in God. How many of us can be honest enough to say that sometimes when life gets hard, it reveals our lack of trust in God, that we're holding on to ourselves, our own salaries, and how well we can manage our money, and the way that we can parent, and the way that we can take care of our bodies, or the way that we try to take care of our aging parents, or the way that we try to process through difficulties with our mental health, and all these things that are just us trying to make our own solutions and hold on when Jesus is saying, Turn to me. Don't take your eyes off the promises of the word that he has given us. And finally, in verse 41, it says, And they were filled with great fear. And they said to one another, Who then is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. And this is where we find out that the message of this passage is not just simply, If Jesus can calm the sea, he can calm the storm inside of me. That is true. Let me emphasize that again. But that's not all that he is showing us in this passage. Because actually what happened was this, and the word confronts us with this, is that Jesus caused a storm, didn't he? That's not easy for us to wrestle with at first. He calmed the sea, and then he stirred up every single one of those disciples. Because they weren't filled with peace like the sea was in that moment, were they? They had to deal with the fact that they say the awesome power of Almighty God standing there in front of them. Who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey him? We might have expected him to say, oh yeah, Jesus, way to go, way to save us. We knew you could do it. But the Bible says that the disciples were filled with great fear. Because now they have to discover just who he is, the real Jesus Not the soft little teddy bear Jesus with the long silky flowing hair that's painted on the old school church wall that probably doesn't look anything like what Jesus looked like, a brown man from the Middle East. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Mm -mm. All authority, all power resting upon God in the flesh, the real Jesus who speaks and whatever he commands is done because he is almighty God. The disciples were confronted with the identity and the authority and the majesty of Jesus. And the early readers of Mark's gospel that were under the persecution of Rome, and you need to remember this. Nero was trying to blame the Christians for the burning of the Circus Maximus and the great fire throughout Rome. And so what he did was he took Christians and he tied them up on posts in his garden, threw pitch and tar on them and lit them on fire while they were alive as decorations for his party. This is the persecution that the early church was going through. And these were the terrors that were breaking over them like the water coming into the boat and thinking that this was going to sink them and drown them. And they did not need a Sunday school lesson that said, Jesus, fix that and he'll fix this for us too. True as that is, they needed the lesson that you and I need That even in the midst of tragedy and pain and some of the worst things that could have happened to a person that maybe some people in the room have been through, and I do not deny that. And I can't even begin to imagine what that kind of pain or trauma feels like for some people that are here today. But God knows. Jesus understands. And he, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, he is enough to get you through to the other side. And if he said, get in the boat, go with me, and we're going to the other side, he will faithfully get you where he says you are going. And that's the message that the early church needed. They needed the lesson that you and I need, that he is ruling and reigning over all things, that he is the king, that he has rescued us from this world, and that his word is always true, and that he will see us to the other side. In the name of the Father. Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can I pray for us? Just bow your heads. God, I thank you for every single skeptic that's here right now. Oh God, I thank you for the doubters. I thank you for the ones that have just been through so much pain and frustration. I thank you for the ones that have been through trial after trial after trial. I thank you for every person in the room that's just saying, God, where are you? 
Thank you for this precious reminder today that you are here moving in this place. Just as we sang earlier, even when I don't see it, you're working. How do I know? Because you promised us in your word that you are. That is who you are. I thank you for every person that needs that reminder that God says that he's going to bring you to the other side, that he has not left you, that he has not forsaken you, that you can cast all of your cares upon him because he cares for you, that he will take your burden from you and place a much lighter one upon you, and you'll learn from it. The ones that feel like they're struck down, I thank you for the word and the promises that we hear that say, I am pressed but not cursed, persecuted, not abandoned. I am struck down, but I am not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for the promises of God shall endure, that his joy will be my strength. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I pray for every person that just got to that place where circumstances were all they're looking at, that right now their eyes would be turned on you the God who is more than enough. We don't know how we're gonna get through it. We don't know what's gonna happen in the meantime, but we know the outcome is that you will get us through to the other side. Praise be to God Almighty. Thank you, Lord Jesus, our strong deliverer. You are the one that we trust in. 